There's only been two football fields since Jesus came to the earth. If you take Jesus' life alone in that same perspective, Jesus didn't even make it to the, to the second, um, to the next down. He, he, he didn't even get a whole 10 yards in his life. That would be 100 years. So if you think of our lives on a football field, they're all less than one 10 yard. None of us ever make it to a new down. We never make it back to first down again. And the football fields, even if we put a million of them end to end, they'll still continue on and on and on. So in perspective, if we look at our lives, just even a few yards within 10 yards on a 100-yard football field, our lives are very small. But then when you start adding the football fields onto football field onto football field onto football field of all eternity, that's a long time, isn't it? And this life is brief. This life feels eternal, doesn't it? Come on, any of you over 50? This life feels like it's been going on forever, doesn't it? Maybe if you're over 40, it might feel that way. All of a sudden, nothing seems to be very new anymore. You know, I, Victoria tells a story about a girl at school who, who she was like 18, got out of school, um, went to college her first year, got married after her first year, then had a kid the next year. I mean, she's the same age as my daughter. She's already got kids and married. And she's like, what's there left? She's like, did it all in like two years, two and a half years. And she's like, I don't get that. And so, because it's like we rush sometimes thinking, oh, it's like, you know, we got so much to do. And, but our life is going to go on and on and on and on if we're serving Jesus. So we need to have a right perspective about this life compared to eternity. Sometimes we get caught up in this life and we see things around us. Things that maybe we don't have. We might see the way other people might prosper. We might seem to think that those who live in sin or, or are bound by evil or have great wealth and power, how they have no account for anything in their life. And we see how much they're enjoying the pleasures of today. Let's face it. When people get caught up in pride and power and money and greed and, and addictions and partying, it's because we see it happening in others' lives, and we want a piece of that. We want to enjoy our lives, too. We want to have all the fun we can have. There's only one life to be lived. But if you look at it in perspective, it's only a few yards on that 100-yard field, which then is going to be multiplied millions of times over for all of eternity. Our few yards in this life are nothing. <laughs> like, oh, okay, that, that's a new one. I have not heard the doorbell ring in church before. Like, and that must have been it. It sounded like it was literally coming from the back door. So, There's a person in the Bible that you might not even know of him or know how to identify him. But his name was Asaph. Asaph wrote Psalm 73 through 83 and Psalm 50. So he wrote about 11 psalms in the Bible. Let me tell you who Asaph was. You see, King David picked Asaph to be the primary musician and worship leader over the entire nation of Israel. There were hundreds upon hundreds of musicians that were worshipers and musicians and participated in leading the praise and worship for the people of the nation of Israel. Only three of them could ever have an audience with King David, and Asaph was even over those three. He was the number one. He was the top guy. He was basically the rock star of the nation of Israel. Everybody looked at him, and he led them in whatever worship and praise would ever take place. In fact, when they dedicated Solomon's temple, because he lived older, longer than David did, he was the singer and the worship leader at the dedication of the first temple of God. It's pretty intense. That's pretty, and if you recall, the Bible talks about the glory of God falling down into that temple where it's just the Shekinah glory of God where they just all fell to their knees and this great cloud just came down and filled that temple. That was Asaph. And he writes this psalm in Psalm 73, a psalm where he is frustrated 
and discouraged and envious and almost to the point of losing faith in God because he looks at the wicked and the sinful and they're wealthy and prosperous, filled with pleasure, crushing other people, having their way, and nothing ever happens to them. He looks at them and thinks they have such amazing lives. And I struggle in pain, I struggle in little, I don't have all that they have. Even though he had great position, I mean, he, they must have had great wealth. Because I'm sure that he was pretty well taken care of as the rock star of Israel. I honestly think Christians look at Hollywood, they look at society, the wealthy, the, the elite classes, the political classes, and they look at all the money, all the wealth, all the power, all the partying, all the things that they have, and they sit there and realize they just keep on going on and on and having more and more and more and seem like they're healthy and strong and surviving. And why is it that they have so much and we struggle? And Christians, we can look today because our perspective gets off of that football field after football field after football field after football field for eternity onto those few yard lines that are our life. And we can get lost in those few yard lines with our perspective looking at what's going on on those yard lines and not realizing there's so much more ahead of us. Asaph in this psalm will eventually come back and remember the truth again and regain his perspective of what the end looks like and what true perspective for eternity actually looks like. Let's read Psalm 73. Psalm 73. He starts off pretty good. He says, truly God is good to Israel, to those whose hearts are pure. But as for me, I almost lose my footing. My feet were slipping and I was almost gone. I mean, He's talking about what we would call today in Christian faith, backsliding, losing his faith, slipping and, and giving up in, in, in his faith in the Lord. He said, for I envied the proud when I saw them prosper despite their wickedness. They seem to live such painless lives. Their bodies are so healthy and strong. They don't have troubles like other people. They're not plagued with problems like everyone else. They wear pride like a jewel necklace and clothe themselves with cruelty. I like verse 7. These fat cats have everything their hearts could ever wish for. I like the New Living Translation. It's a little translation, but it really puts it in today's English. These fat cats have everything their hearts could ever wish for. And what's he doing? He's getting jealous. They scoff and speak only evil in their pride. They seek to crush others. They boast against the very heavens, and their words strut throughout the earth. Sounds like politicians to me. Not Gabe. Not Gabe. No, no offense, Gabe. So it's like, I got to remember, we got we to gotta stay congressmen in our midst these days. So it's like, sorry about that. Thank you, Gabe, for serving until like four in the morning in session this, this week. I know you're fighting for some good stuff. <laughs> National politicians, we'll leave it that. We won't talk about state level. <laughs> and so the people are dismayed and confused, drinking in all their words. What does God know, they ask? Does the Most High even know what's happening? Asaph was so frustrated, he's like, doesn't God see? Doesn't he see the corruption? Doesn't he see the, 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 the advantage they take of other people? Doesn't he see all their sin? And yet he lets them go on and on, and yet, yet we everyday people, we just struggle? Look at these wicked people enjoying a life of ease while their riches multiply. Come on, don't ever tell me that you never didn't look at the wealthy and the rich and the powerful in our world today and kind of feel the same way. And then he asks this question in verse 13. Did I keep my heart pure for nothing? Mm. Did I keep myself innocent for no reason? He was measuring walking a pure life before God, an innocent life before the Lord, a life honoring the word of God and the laws of God and purity and looking at how these people have had all the success and enjoyment in this world and asked is, is it really worth serving Jesus? 
well, in his day, serving the Lord because Jesus wasn't around yet. He says, I get nothing but trouble all day long. Every morning brings me pain. If I had really spoken this way to others, I would have been a traitor to your people. Verse 16 says, so I try to understand why the wicked prosper, but what a difficult task it is. Come on, have you ever felt that way before? Perspective. It's so easy in this world. It's so easy in this world filled with, with TV and radio and, and media and phones and social media and Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and, and, and Snapchat and all these other things. It's so easy to get our minds focused on the things of this earth and what others have and what others are doing and the successes and power of others. But then verse 17, here's the trick. He says, then I went into your sanctuary, O God. Then I went into your sanctuary, O God, and I finally understood the destiny of the wicked. All of a sudden, when he came in to meet with the Lord, all of a sudden we came in to meet with God in prayer, the perspective that this life is just a few yards in comparison to the whole field and another 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 field, and another field until eternity forever, then he started to realize that what these people get in this few yards doesn't matter because for eternity, it ain't going to be good. It isn't going to be pretty. Verse 18, truly you put them on a slippery path and send them sliding over the cliff to destruction. In an instant, they are destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. I think one of the most profound paintings I've ever seen was when we were in Italy a few years back, 2018, and we were in, we were in uh, one of the museums, uh, you know, with, with the, the famous art from old days, and, and, and a piece from a cathedral was in this museum, a painting. And it was a painting of hell, and a lot of the cathedrals had sections in them where there were paintings of hell in them. And you saw almost this depicted, people slipping over the edge of a path and into the terrors of hell. And in the paintings were depictions of basically the sin of mankind and whatever sin people endured and enjoyed on this earth, whatever, and if it was sin against others, was being committed against them in violence by demonic force. And you just, it made the reality of the torture of hell stand out and how bad hell really is. And the thing is, they might have for these few years, they might have all the wealth, all the pleasure, all the want that they have here on this earth. But for that same amount of eternity, the rest of the football field, add another one, add another one, add another one, so there's a thousand and a million and a million millions of football fields. They will be in that torturous place called hell. Verse 19 again, in an instant they are destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. When you arise, O Lord, you will laugh at their silly ideas as a person laughs at dreams in the morning. You ever laugh at your dream in the morning? Come on, you ever have a stupid dream at night and you get up and you laugh at it? I, I can't tell you, I mean, sometimes I get up and I just, I wake up with going, ha! I can't believe that I just dreamed something so stupid. Then I realized that my heart was bitter and I was all torn up inside. I was so foolish and ignorant I must have seemed like a senseless animal to you. Yet I still belong to you, and you hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, leading me to a glorious destiny. I believe that glorious destiny is not only good things on this earth that God brings into our life, but more so the things of eternity. And then he says, who whom have I in heaven but you? I desire you more than anything on earth. Oh, here comes perspective. Here comes perspective. My health may fail and my spirit may grow weak, but God remains the strength of my heart. He is mine forever. Three yards, all of eternity. He is mine forever. 
Those who desert him will perish, for you destroy those who abandon you. But as for me, how good it is to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my shelter, and I will tell everyone about the wonderful things you do. You see, in all of his frustration and anger to the point where he almost gave in to a sinful attitude, he almost returned into a sinful life, he almost tried to endeavor to be like the wicked and the wealthy and the prosperous and enjoy the pleasures that they had. And then he realized, hold it. And he goes into the sanctuary, which is symbolic of us turning to God in prayer. And God adjusts his perspective so he can see clearly. There's nothing better than clarity, than clear sight. The first thing he realizes is that we shouldn't be jealous. Say that, don't be jealous. So many people fall into sin, fall away from the Lord because they become jealous of what they see others in this world doing, having, how they're prospering. Go back to that verse where he says, they're fat cats who have everything their hearts could ever wish for or desire, and they pride in crushing others. In this life, it really doesn't matter how much or how little we have, because this life is short in comparison with eternity. We can be so focused on the things that we can gain and add in and, and enjoy. And I'm not saying that you can't enjoy things in this life. That's not what I'm saying. But if that becomes our great focus, if that becomes the things that hold us back, if those are the things that keep us from doing what God wants us to do in our lives, because we, we just want to have the ease that everybody else in the world seems to have. Why do they have it easy? And because I'm serving God, I have it hard. They don't seem to have pain or suffering. They're strong. They're healthy. They have all the success. You know what he was doing? He was coveting. He was jealous of what they had. He wanted what they possessed. The last commandment given in Exodus 20, verse 17 says, you must not covet your neighbor's house. You must not covet your neighbor's wife, male or female servant, ox or donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. Here's what I found. <laughs> the final commandment is a reminder to not covet what others have. Yet, there's an obsession in our world. There's an obsession, obsession in American society to covet. All marketing is preying upon covetousness. All media is preying upon covetousness. Social media preys upon covetousness. Teenagers' minds are melted at young ages by TikTok videos that tell them everything they should have or possess or take part of. But teenagers and adults, I want you to realize, you can have that for a few years but what are you doing in light of all of eternity? Because perspective is everything. Those of us who have Jesus in our hearts do not be deceived by the success and the temporal ease in the world around us. It says in verse 11, he says, the people of God are confused and dismayed that God allows all this to happen. To even think that he said in verses 13 and 14, did I keep my heart pure for nothing? You know, if you're a newer Christian, or maybe if you're a, a person who's been serving Jesus for a long time, but you're still an immature Christian, if you're tempted to sin in the things of this world because you feel like you're missing out, then you haven't gotten your perspective clear with Jesus yet. But even this man who led the worship in all of Israel, did I keep my heart pure for nothing? I get nothing but trouble. He's the head of the worship for the entire nation. And yet, his heart is being pulled away because it's, it's a sin, part of our sinful nature to be drawn towards those things of this earth. But we need to realize that when we become jealous and covetous of all those things, when we turn our back on God, when we turn our back on, 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 on what God's done, when we experience hardship in our life and we see other people with ease and so we get mad at God, then we're allowing sinful attitudes to creep into our hearts and our lives instead of keeping ourselves set apart for the eternal things that God has in store for us. Because we are created for better things. Next one, William. 
You and I, we are created for greater things. We're not of this world. We're created for greater things in Jesus Christ. The writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 11, 8 to 16, he recalls people of faith in the Old Testament. It says, it was by faith, verse 8, that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. I want you to think, it wasn't like he could Google the place he was heading off to. When God called Abraham to go to, uh, to, to the, a land that he was promising him, he had no idea what he would find when he got there. He had no idea who would be there when he arrived. He had no idea how hard the road would be on his way. He just knew that God had spoken and he had to trust him. And when he reached the land God promised him, he lived there by faith, for he was like a foreigner. Living in tents. Abraham got to the land of promise, and yet it wasn't like he was possessing the land yet. It wouldn't be for hundreds of years that his descendants would possess the land. The same for Isaac and Jacob, who inherited the same promise. Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations. A city designed and built by God. You see, there was a certain reality that it really was not what's on this earth, but what's in the eternal. It was by faith that even Sarah was able to have a child through, though she was barren and was too old, she believed that God would keep his promise. And so a whole nation came from this one man who was as good as dead, a nation with so many people that like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore, there's no way to count them. These people still exist today. All these people died still believing what God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised in that 10-yard line. They didn't get it in their lifetime here. But their hope is in the eternal. But they saw it all from a distance and welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on earth. Obviously, people who say such things are looking forward to a country they can call their own. If they had longed for the country they came from, they could have gone back. But they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. This is why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And you know that our eternity, our promise of eternity, is not just heaven. You all understand that after the great millennial reign of Christ, there will be a new heaven and a new earth, and a great city that will descend upon the new earth. And we will live in a new earth and a new economy, and we will live and walk out our lives in a new way for all of eternity. It's not just heaven. 1 Peter 2.11, he says, Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. In other words, Peter's saying, don't be tempted by the things in these, in these years right here, in this 10-yard in this, in this zone. Don't be tempted by those things. They're temporary. They wage against your soul for all of eternity. This world is not our home. Let me reread verses 17 to 24 of Psalm 73. Then I went into your sanctuary, God, and I finally understood the destiny of the wicked. Truly you put them on a slippery path and send them sliding over the cliff to destruction. In an instant they are destroyed and completely swept away by terrors. When you arise, O oh Lord, you will laugh at their silly ideas as a person laughs at dreams in the morning. He's saying God's going to laugh at them. Then I realized that my heart was bitter. I realized. And I was all torn up inside. In other words, he realized God created me for greater things. God created me for more. Asaph comes to the realization that there's more. And in verse 22, I was so foolish and ignorant, I must have seemed like a senseless animal to you. You know animals are not the same as people. Don't you all know that? I mean, they're, some are pretty smart and they're pretty good, but they're not the same as people. They live for the moment. They live for, for what, animals don't have the sense of time that we have. They don't have a sense of, you know, we've, we've humanized animals through cartoons and media in, in our society, but animals, they're not people. And they don't have our same sense of time. And they are senseless, and they do acts that are senseless. Even things that they know will, will, could bring them harm because they're taken away by what they desire. You've heard me share my, about my dogs before. Well, let's talk about the poodle. Remember the poodle, the one that I said 
that relies on great grace to even exist in my home because she just, she just doesn't seem to think anything is wrong. This poodle has been punished so many times for, this, for, for the same act, stealing paper, napkins, tissues, paper off the roll in the bathroom. It doesn't matter what it is. She likes, you know, I, I, I love to clean my eyeglasses when I'm wearing my glasses. I can't stand, like, like gook on my glasses. She likes to eat those things, too. I'm so glad I pay kids to clean up the dog pen. I don't want to see all the paper. We had Victoria and a friend from school were home last week, and we had to keep on saying, shut the bathroom door, because the toilet paper roll would just be wound out all through the house. When you sit down on the couch and you're maybe having dinner in front of the TV one night and you got a napkin and sometimes I'll just like the napkin's just kind of sitting on me and all of a sudden she just kind of creeps up and goes, Phew. goes away with the napkin, chews it on the ground. And I've just given up. She eats the whole thing, so she just cleans up after herself. It doesn't matter how often she's yelled at. It doesn't matter if she's punished. It doesn't matter what happens. She is a senseless animal when it comes to paper. The world and their sin are senseless animals. Their unredeemed nature, their unforgiven, their unchanged, sinful man, always going after what makes them happy in the moment. And Asaph looks at this and goes, I must have been like a senseless animal to think that I wanted only the pleasures that flee are fleeting for a moment, rather than knowing that I have the, uh, the provision and the abundance of God for the eternity and the rest of not just my life on this earth, but forever and ever and ever and ever. And he says, yes, I still belong to you and you hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, leading me to glorious destiny. He recognizes, God, you're upholding me. God, you're guiding me. God, you hold on to me. Who needs what the world has to offer? Why should we be tempted to go back to the things that this world is doing and the sinfulness because it just looks like they're having so much more fun or they have so much more wealth or so much of this world? Because God says, I'm the one who upholds you. I'm the one who guides and leads you. I'm the one who holds on to you and surrounds you. He said, oh, to be near to God, in verse 28. So he corrects himself. And he corrects his, his, his perspective on looking at what this world has and realize that having God is all he really needs because he comes to the conclusion that God is my portion. God is our portion. I want to read verses 25 to 26 in three different versions. First in the New King James. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart. And here's the line I want you to understand because this word is what is recognized most close to the Hebrew. And my portion forever. We're going to talk about that in a minute. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. The message says it this way, and realize the message is a paraphrase, but sometimes it's good to read it. You're all I want in heaven. You're all I want on earth. When my skin sags and my bones get brittle, God is rock firm and faithful. The New Living Translation, whom have I in heaven but you? I desire you more than anything on earth. My health may fail, and my spirit may grow weak, but God remains the strength of my heart. He is mine forever. That word, that last phrase, that God is mine forever, the Hebrew word is kelek, and it really is best described as the word portion. And when you look at that translation of that word portion, it's talking about our share in the inheritance. If someone passes away and they divide their inheritance amongst their children or other people, each gets a portion of what they possessed. And what he's recognizing is as an heir of God, 
I have a portion or an inheritance, a place in the house of God my Father for all eternity. I will be provided for, my needs will be met, I will be kept with joy, he will surround me, he will guard me, he will uphold me, he will bring me into a glorious destiny. This is what's ours, not necessarily in these 10 years of life, but this is what we have for the rest of the thousand years on the field. And another thousand, and another thousand, and another millions of thousands, and for all the rest of time. Now, in perspective, what's more important? Your pleasure, your sinful pleasure, and what you might have in the 30, 50, 70, 90 years here on earth? Or for the rest of eternity? God is my portion forever. Jesus reinforces this in Matthew 6, 19 to 20 when he says, don't store up treasures here on earth where moth eats them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. You know, we sometimes cherish old relics and things of value. I remember a couple of years ago when Notre Dame caught on fire in Paris. Significant, Kimberly and I had just visited it a couple of years before with Victoria. This beautiful architectural cathedral with, you know, these old paintings and relics and things. And yet, in what, in a day? A massive portion of it burns. Because everything on this earth, even as old as it can get and be preserved, can still be destroyed in a moment. But what we invest in the kingdom of God, what we invest into other people's lives, what we invest in our walk with Jesus, that is forever. Paul writes in 1 Timothy 6, 19, by doing this they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. In other words, when we give ourselves to fully serving God and following God, our time, our resources, our energy, our hearts, our love, we are investing into the portion that is ours forever. Temporary pleasure on this earth ends in destruction, but eternal, eternal life will last for all time. Verses 18 and 19 of that psalm, truly, we, I, we've already read that. I'm going to just go past it. 2 Corinthians 4, 18 says, So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. We have a portion forever. Isn't that a good thing? Aren't you thankful that God will be our portion forever? So Christian, realize I know it's human sometimes to think like Asaph did, to look at the round of the wicked and how they prosper, how they have much, but it's divine to realize that our end, our end is for eternity and we have an inheritance instead of destruction. Don't be tempted to lose faith. Don't be tempted to yield back to sin. Don't be tempted to be covetous for the things that people in this world might have thinking that maybe it has more value, but realize what you have in Christ as eternal is the greatest value, the greatest inheritance you could ever possess. Hold fast, hold strong, and let God truly be the strength of your heart and your soul. Would you bow your heads with me? There's some of you in this room today and you so understand what I'm saying right now. Even the most spiritual ones in this room have looked at the prosperity of the wicked and been frustrated. It's easy to look at the prosperity of the wicked and feel frustration. Why do they do so well, God? Why do you allow them to get away with the evil that they get away with? 
Why do you allow them to crush other people? Why do they flourish in their lives? Why do they, why do they get to party and just go on and on and on? It seems like nothing ever stops them. When we come back to the place of prayer, God reminds us, fall, they're going to fall off the edge of the cliff before they know it. But your portion is forever. Your portion, your inheritance is eternal. Don't look at just what some have only in this life, but look what God is preparing you for all of eternity. And when you set your heart to do right, don't think that you kept yourself pure for nothing. Don't think that you gave something up for nothing. Don't think that when you gave up maybe a dream of yours so you could serve the Lord or do what God had called you to do, that it was for nothing. Because it has eternal value. You're storing up treasure in heaven. Oh, but I'm feeling it here on earth. But you're storing up treasure in heaven. But everybody else has it here on earth. But you're storing up treasure in heaven. And the things of the eternal, the things of that next life, that thing of what is to come, far, 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 far outweighs anything you can have in this earth. God is knocking on some hearts right now in this room. And he's speaking to some people right here in this room this morning. And he's saying, your perspective has gotten off path. You've gotten your perspective back onto all the stuff of the world. And I want you to get back on the stuff that's eternal. I want you to adjust that perspective back to what is eternal in value. I want you to come back into the sanctuary, to the place of the altar, to the place of my presence, and realize that I'm the one who upholds you. I'm the one who guides you. I'm the one who's holding on to you. And I have a portion for you for all of eternity. Get your eyes off of this world and set them on me. Set them on my plans for you. May my purposes come alive in your heart and your life today. Jesus. Jesus. You know, can we do that this morning? If God is speaking to you, if he's trying to adjust something in your heart today, would you come to the front as an altar, as the sanctuary? Would you just come and say, God, adjust my perspective? Come on, just get up out of your seat and come on, come on up. Lord, adjust my perspective. Maybe you've been tempted by the things of this world. Maybe you've been seeing other things you've just desired, but God's saying, hold it, I want to adjust. Come on, just come on up and adjust your perspective right now. The altar's open. Come on, don't wait. Don't wait. There are a few up here. There's more room. I know God's speaking to more than just three this morning. I know he's speaking to more than just a few today. It's okay. There's something that happens when we step out in faith. There's something that happens when we step out and we put our, and we come and say, God, adjust my perspective. I'm coming into the sanctuary. I want to come and get my eyes focused back on you, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Putting our focus on the one that matters, Jesus. This life is short. This life is temporary. Our inheritance is forever. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. There's still more room up at the front. There's still more room to come to that place and just reach out to the Lord. Those at the front, just, just lift up your hands to the Lord. Just reach out to him right now. And say, God, I'm looking to you. I want to put my focus all on you today. Lord, forgive me if I've been tempted by the things of this earth. Forgive me if I've been tempted and jealous and coveted the things that others might have had. Lord, I want to be content. I want what you have for me. I want to look at eternity today, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus.
Jesus from the streets, Jesus in the darkness, we're every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Come on, just look to him right now. His power, your name is healing. His name is life. Your name is life. Thank you, Jesus. You know, I know those who have come to the front, maybe you just in your seat today. Do you need to get your eyes set back on Jesus this morning? Just get your eyes back on Jesus today. Get your eyes on an eternal perspective because God is your portion forever. That's a promise, church. That's a promise that we who are serving Jesus we have that eternal hope. It's not just heaven. It's a new heaven and a new earth and a new economy and a new day and a day which we will rule with him and reign with him. It's a promise. Don't let the corrupt of this earth persuade you away from the things of God. Young people, don't let, don't let what you see, the media and the marketing and the TikTok, don't let all of that pull you away from what God wants to do in your life. This life is but at most maybe a 10 yard distance on a football field. But there, those football fields go on and on and on, but that 10 yard, that's all it's gonna ever be. You can live for today or you can live for eternity. If you wanna live for eternity, stand to your feet today. If you want to live for eternity, and not for today. Stand to your feet today because it's the eternal things that matter. Jesus, see those who stand this morning. Lord, we don't want to be so focused on this earth that we forget the eternal value, the portion, the inheritance for eternity. It's not just heaven that's a reward, but Lord, there's a day that you're going to judge the earth and those who have sinned will be bound and cast into the lake of fire for eternity. But Lord God, the rest, we will live in a new heaven and a new earth like you originally planned in creation where there will be no more sin, there will be no more tears, there will be no more sorrow. But we will live thriving, productive, beautiful lives, a glorious destiny that our finite minds cannot even begin to comprehend. And Lord, we commit ourselves to you, Lord Jesus, not just through this life, but knowing that the next, the eternity, is ours to enjoy in that glorious destination. Can you just thank him for that hope, church? Come on. Just thank him right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the hope of eternity. Thank you for the hope of eternity. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I pray over your people now, Lord, as we prepare to leave this place today, that we would go with a different perspective than what we may have come in with today. Lord, that we would go with the perspective and that we would give ourselves to that which is eternal. We want you to be glorified in us. And thank you, Jesus, that you uphold us, that you guide us into a glorious destiny and that you hold on to us. We are yours, and we thank you for that great hope. And we give you the praise and the glory for it. We all say it, and say it with me, church, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you as you go. Have an amazing week this week. We'll see you Wednesday night, again next Sunday.